Let's start with the first key principle for validation and verification. That is to define your research question. It's pretty challenging, super important in research in general. So let's go through a couple examples. For simulation in particular, in defining a research question, you really want to say, do you really need modeling and simulation to answer your question? If you can just do an experiment to answer your question, do that. It's a better approach. But as I mentioned, many times experimental data alone are not sufficient. So if you do need a modeling and simulation, then um, that is a good test to do initially. Second is, can you test your hypothesis with a modeling or simulation setup? So let's give some specific examples here. Let's take this research question. Does switching from walking to running put muscles in a better state to generate force? So what do I mean by that? If I'm switching my gait, making a gait transition from walking here to running here, would it change how the muscle is operating? For example, here's a force velocity relationship. If walking is here and running is here, if I have this hypothesis, then the, the muscle is actually slowing down, operating at a lower velocity when I switch from walking to running, and maybe that is an energy saving mechanism. Let's say I have that idea. In fact, there were some beautiful ultrasound measurements that suggested this in the gastrocnemius muscle, and we wanted to dive in a little deeper with a simulation and test this. So the question is, if that is my question, is it well suited for modeling and simulation? There really can be three outcomes. One, yeah, it needs modeling and simulation and it, the hypothesis is testable. B, no, it doesn't need modeling and simulation. You could answer this fully with experimental data. Or C, it's impossible, forget it. Uh, you're, you're, you're dreaming if you think you're gonna make a simulation that does that. Well, for this case, I would argue that this is a really good question for modeling and simulation. We can answer the question, our hypothesis is testable, so that's what I suggest. Let's take another one. Let's say uh, you have this question. Does hamstring surgery improve crouch gait in children with cerebral palsy? What we know, what I'm plotting here, is the percentage of patients and the degree of improvement in crouch gait. So zero means no improvement after surgery. And you see there's some that actually get worse. Very close to zero is not much of a change. And these folks actually uh, get better. So we, we wanna see, does hamstring surgery improve the crouch gait for individuals um, with cerebral palsy? What do you think? Is this a well-defined question? Yes, it needs modeling and simulation and it's testable. No, it doesn't need modeling and simulation or it's impossible. Think about it. I'll give an answer, but there's more than one answer here. I'll say, yes, the question needs modeling and simulation. And here's why. When we addressed this question, we wanted to know the length of the hamstrings and the velocities of the hamstrings during walking in crouch gait and in unimpaired gait. To calculate those muscle tendon lengths and velocities, we needed a musculoskeletal model. And we wanted to see if that it was influencing the outcome. So that's why I put this in the category of, yes, it needs simulation and it's testable. If you just wanted to see if people got better after surgery, then you don't need a modeling and simulation approach. You could just examine them experimentally before, and after, and you see if there's an improvement. But here we wanted to predict whether estimating hamstrings, lengths, and velocities helped improve the outcome. Indeed, it does. And for that approach, we needed modeling and simulation. So now many people do calculate muscle tendon lengths and velocities prior to surgery, which is a really nice use of simple musculoskeletal modeling. Now let's take a related question, and it says, what kinematic pattern will a patient adopt after surgery? So let's say you have experimental data, you know uh, how someone's walking before a surgery, and you wanna be able to predict, they're gonna have a surgery, you wanna be able to predict their walking pattern after surgery. What do you think? Yes, needs modeling, 
and is testable? No. B, doesn't need modeling. Who cares? C, it's impossible. Now, we wrote this question a few years ago, and at that time, I answered, it's impossible. This is something I've wanted to do for 30 years. I got into modeling and simulation because we were looking at kids with cerebral palsy having surgeries and the outcomes were quite variable. I wanted to just be able to, and the docs wanted to be able to predict, and the families wanted to be able to predict, if I have this surgery, what's gonna happen? And for decades, that simply hasn't been possible. It's so challenging because we have to predict not only how the mechanics change, but how the nervous system changes. We don't have a model of the nervous system in an impaired individual and how it's gonna change post-surgery. But we're just now getting to the point where I might switch this from a C to an A because we're now making predictions with various impairments and with surgery, what the gait will look like post-operatively. So as the field advances, we're gonna switch from a C to an A. Let's go to our fourth and final example. And we wanna know in this example, which muscles break, propel, and support body weight during running. So by that, I mean which muscles when I'm running generate a ground reaction force that is in the backward direction or in the forward direction. So which muscles break, which muscles propel, and which muscles support body weight? What do you think? Could I do that with experiments alone? In which case you'd answer B. Do I need a model or a simulation and our hypothesis is testable or again, is it impossible? This question needs modeling and simulation. We can't without modeling and simulation figure out what muscles contribute to ground reaction force. And Sam Hamner, who was a student in the lab, did a beautiful job answering exactly that question. And you can see the results of Sam's studies in some detail in various papers and in the textbook. Okay, so we've talked about defining a research question. Do you need simulation and can you test our hypothesis? The other aspect of this is only do the study if you're gonna make a novel and important contribution to the field. That's the other reason. Developing models and simulations is quite challenging. Sometimes it's necessary and if you can make an important contribution to the field, that's gonna be key. So what do I mean by making an important contribution? How could you do that? Will my research improve our understanding of typical or pathologic motion? If you get fundamental insights, that's an important contribution. Will my research improve the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of a pathology? In many cases, that's what motivates us. And you should answer for your own research whether or not you will be able to provide improved diagnosis, treatment, or understanding. And third, and I think very important, will others be able to reproduce and build on my work? Now to do that, once you finish your simulations, you're gonna to have to share your model, share your software, share your results in a way that others can reproduce it. And given these tests, I would go through that in your mind for your various research ideas and see if they meet these criteria. What we typically do is not generate one research idea, but we generate dozens of research ideas. We then run it through this. Will we make an important contributions? And we pick the ones where experiments alone are not sufficient, models are gonna really be really helpful, and we're gonna make uh, novel and important contributions. So that's where we are, uh, defining research questions. We'll now move on to understanding and evaluating the methods.